Massimo, it's good to see you again. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, uh, welcome to our audience, the Sophia Watchers, uh, Meaning of Life TV, part of the Blogging Heads TV network. And I'm once again here with my partner in crime, uh, Massimo Piliucci. Massimo, want to do your introduction, and I'll do mine, and we can get started. Sounds good. Uh, I'm Massimo Piliucci. I'm the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at City College in New York City. And I am Professor Daniel Kaufman. I teach philosophy at Missouri State University. So Massimo, today we are going to talk about an, a topic that is of great interest to both of us and I think will be in, of interest to the audience, and that is um, on some of the core ways in which the social sciences differ from the natural sciences. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, so I thought maybe we'd start off um, and I, I wrote an essay about this recently. It's been something that's been on my mind a lot. It's a topic of interest of mine. I'll link to the essay, obviously, in the link section. Um, right. Yeah, I, I read it. It was uh, well done. I, I have a number of points of disagreement, but you know that's right that's idea. <laughs> and, and it was sort of it was a first stab. Um, it was very much not anyway. I completed uh, a completed set of thoughts, and I've been thinking about it a lot since then, and doing a lot of reading. So um, I thought we'd start off though with maybe you, given. We're very fortunate that you have both a natural science background and a philosophy background, and you're really the ideal person to talk to about this. Um, I would love it if you would give me your understanding of what we mean by explanations in the physical sciences. So when we say that we uh, engage in uh, the physical sciences to find the explanations, to give explanations of various phenomena, uh, what do we mean when we talk about explanations in the physical sciences? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the the physical sciences as opposed to the natural sciences, which of course is, in my mind at least, is broader. Because I do think that there is a distinction to be made up to a point uh, between the actual physical science, meaning mostly physics, chemistry, uh, and you know geology, probably, on the one hand, and biology on the other hand. Biology so, is one of the natural sciences, but but I do think there is an important distinction to be made there because I think biology. Uh, is the bridge basically between the natural science and the physical sciences on the one hand and the social sciences on the other hand. Okay, that, that, that's good and may also maybe highlight some disagreements between us. Sure. Um, although I do realize that there are special issues in biology that don't apply, have come up in physics. I am more inclined to be somewhat separate um, the social sciences from all the rest. And so go ahead and talk about the physical sciences for now and then maybe... So, in physical science, uh, you know, so it used to be before quantum mechanics. Let's let's bracket quantum mechanics for a minute, right? But before quantum mechanics, it used to be that uh, throughout the scientific revolution and into the early modern times. So we're talking about from you know from Galileo and and then Newton up until essentially Einstein and Bohr. Um, in physics, in the physical sciences, in the natural sciences, explanation uh, was based on a causal understanding. Uh, what was going on. So, you know, it's either a, a body hitting another body or, or a body transferring, uh, you know, um, uh, heat from one place to another or a chemical reaction or, you know, a it was a mechanical view of the universe, right? Um, now, that, of course, changed to, a, to some extent, uh, I think changed partially uh, with the advent of quantum mechanics. Uh, because, of course, in quantum mechanics, even though theoretically you can still talk about causes, and some people, in some fundamental physicists do talk about causes, really the concept of cause doesn't seem to be making much of a, having that, that much of a sort of fundamental role in, in quantum mechanics because stuff just happens, right? So there is this fundamental randomness to what's going on in quantum mechanics. And I don't mean to say... That, you know, I do realize that quantum mechanical equations are deterministic, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not using the word randomness in that sense. But it is true that in quantum mechanics uh, is essentially a uh, description of the universe in terms of things just happening. Uh, you know, when, when uh, um, uh, an atom decays, for instance, uh, the, the, the time of decay is entirely random. There is nothing different about the atom, as far as we can tell, in the moment right before it's going to decay, and as opposed to you know a thousand years bef uh, before that point, uh, the rate of decay is deterministic. We can tell exactly, uh, you know, with a very high degree of precision, 
what is the likelihood that at any particular moment that uh, a particular atom is going to decay, but we cannot tell when that's actually a, a specific atom is going to, is going to decay. So quantum mechanics is a little change. It has changed the rule a little bit. The rules a little bit. It's a much more me less mechanistic view, and, and and also then of course, as you know, in quantum mechanics, then immediately we start getting into these different interpretations, which to me means we're doing philosophy and metaphysics more than actual physics. Uh, you know, what does it mean to have you know the collapse of the wave function? Well, it's not clear. I mean, the mathematics is pretty obvious, but what it, that means in in terms of sort of physics is not clear at all. I don't think that quantum mechanics at the moment. Uh, is really in the business of giving mechanistic understandings of, of things. So causality, I don't want to say that, that causality went out the window with quantum mechanics. It certainly didn't. But it really is looked at in a different way uh, now, even in fundamental physics. So let me just ask you before you go on. Um, to generalize from what you just said, prior to quantum mechanics, would you say that roughly speaking, what we meant in the physical sciences by an explanation of some phenomena was to offer some sort of antecedent event which is in some sense sufficient for the 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 follow the phenomena that follows is is that what you're saying yeah saying and, and yeah. that that's no longer the case in the case that's, of quantum that, mechanics that's strictly that's right strictly no longer the case because really in quantum mechanics you talk about equations and you talk about laws of nature but you don't talk about specific causality in, in specific events. Now, of course, the concept of law of nature has been around far earlier than, than quantum mechanics. So one could also say that the older mechanistic physics was based on explanations that derive their power from the idea of laws of nature. But to some extent, that to me, as a, as a, as a philosopher especially, kind of begs the question, because you know, to say that things happen because the laws of nature are such, it's only shifting you know, the explanation, the explanatory level, one more level, one, one more level, because one could say, well, yeah, and why are the laws of physics, laws of physics, the laws of nature that way? I mean, what does that mean to have a law of nature? There's a lot of this, there's been a lot of discussion over the last two or three decades in philosophy about what do scientists actually mean when they talk about laws of nature? Right. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it sometimes actually often, it sounds like they really are thinking about laws, as in, you know, there's, there's, there's some reason out there why things are always in a certain way. Right. But on the other hand, a much more uh, reasonable understanding that sort of several philosophers have developed and a number of physicists have agreed on is the idea that just laws of physics are simply generalization. There's just empirical generalizations. Uh, they may be exceptionless. Maybe. We don't, we don't really know because we don't have access to all quarters of the universe. Um, and nor do we have access to all times in the universe. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that the, the safest thing is to say that laws of nature themselves are the result of certain kinds of interactions between, you know, physical stuff. Um, so it, which means that, in fact, laws of nature themselves are, are based on, on the idea of causality. Right. So laws of nature are just um, widely general, generalizable. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's right. causal causal relations is what they essentially are, right? I mean, that's I right. mean, I mean, um, uh, they take the form of A's cause B's, right? right. Um, um, so, are you saying though that? Let me ask you this. I mean, this maybe this is a serious point. I mean, are you saying that because of quantum mechanics, at this point, we can't really give a general account of what an explanation in the physical sciences consists of? Um, yeah, that may very well be. I mean, and it's in fact, it's not even just quantum mechanics. I mean, if you start going from physics then to biology, okay, so maybe talk about biology now. Bring that yeah, into the picture, right? So you, you you immediately realize that even though biologists themselves talk about often talk about in terms of causality, in fact, all of the so-called special sciences, which as you know, are every science other than fundamental physics. Uh, or at least every natural science. Which is, I, I've never heard it. This, I mean, I, I, I think it's defined different ways because special yeah. sciences when I was in school were always, always were the social sciences. Right. Um, the ones that you have trouble reducing, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, but but I, I've heard your... But as it turns out, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Jerry Fodor's famous uh, uh, paper back in the 70s that we, we probably should link to. Uh, about the special sciences. I mean, right. it, it, yeah, that's right. It, it, they are thought of in terms of reducibility. As it, as it turns out, uh, not only you cannot reduce, uh, by, and by that I mean theoretically reduce, um, 
you know, giving it an explanation of one in terms of theory of the other. Uh, you cannot reduce the social sciences to physics. You cannot reduce uh, biology to physics. In fact, uh, a number of philosophers have argued that you cannot even reduce chemistry to physics, even though that's supposed to be the, the textbook right, right. example of theoretical reduction. So uh, now, just to be clear, I, I know you know this, but, but since we always get into trouble for when we talk about these things, or at least I get into trouble when I got, talk about reduction, let me be clear. I am not talking about ontological reduction, meaning that I'm not talking about the fact that I think that somehow living organisms are made of anything other than quarks or strings or whatever it is. Of course they are. Right. I'm talking about theoretical reduction, and which means we're talking about understanding, human understanding. I am saying that quantum mechanics cannot, even in principle, really, be used to explain biological phenomena because the damn biological phenomena are too damn complicated. And even if you try it, even if somebody did know how to, to use quantum mechanics, it would be hopelessly complicated for a human mind to understand. So no, there isn't going to be any theoretical reduction uh, of biology to, to fundamental physics. Uh, that's what I mean. I don't mean that somehow biological right. organisms are magical and they don't, right. you know, they don't obey the laws of physics. Right. So, so if quantum mechanics provide sort of problematizes the idea that physical explanations are basically the providing of antecedent events that are sufficient for subsequent events. How does biology problematize that picture of antecedent ev of explanations as antecedent events that are sufficient for subsequent events? Well, so here's one way to put. It. I mean, there's a number of ways to approach the problem, but one way to put it is this: as you as you know, um, uh, with Galileo and, and and Newton, sort of the one of the four fundamental Aristotelian causes went out of the window, the, the, the final cause. Right? Yeah, purpose. So science, right, purpose. So science started uh, with, the, with the scientific revolution of the 16th century and beyond. Essentially, the, the question of what is this thing for went out of the practice of science. And by the practice of science, really, I should say the practice of physics, because it was mostly physics and to some extent chemistry uh, that, you know, Boyle and people. Right, like, right. right. Now, then comes 1859, Darwin. And all of a sudden, uh, what, is things, what are things for? It's back into the picture. Because, you know, Darwin and every biologist since have actually talked very clearly and very explicitly about, well, the eyes are for seeing. Uh, the hands are for doing something, you know, manipulating things, and so on and so forth. You know, the, the heart is for uh, pumping blood, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they don't mean that met just metaphorically. They mean that if you if you go away from that kind of if you try to stay away from that kind of talk, you have no understanding of what the hell is going on in biology. Okay, stop there for a minute because this is a really something that you you may need to explain. Um, the popular notion is that one of the real accomplishments of Darwin was precisely in showing how the appearance of purpose in nature. Ah. really isn't purpose in it. Just, so could you disambiguate yes. the sense in which he he, yeah. he is part of the general scientific revolution of rejecting purpose and in what way purposes are are not eliminable? Ah, okay. So so let's make this distinction. This is a great question. Let's make this distinction uh, between teleonomy and teleology. Okay. So teleos, of course, has to do with causes, with final causes. Um, that's, that's the Greek word that Aristotle used. Now, the difference between teleology and teleonomy is precisely that teleology actually is about actual purpose. So if God, let's say, created the universe, right. then the universe would be would be a teleological place, meaning right. that it had the purpose of being, you know, fulfilling whatever God's plans are. Um, Tonight, when I'm going to go out and I'm going to go around, you know, to the Whole Foods around the corner to do my shopping for dinner, that is a teleological process that I'm engaging with, which, of course, will bring us eventually to the social sciences. Yes, yes. Right? Because I have the intention. This is not just a random movement that looks to outsiders as if I had a purpose. I have a purpose. My purpose is to go out there and get me something to eat nice for, for, for to cook for dinner tonight, right? So God's actions... Uh, and and human actions, and if there are Martians out there, Martian, you know, intelligent, conscious Martians, Martians' actions are teleological uh, uh, in nature. They they have actual, they display actual purpose. They have the res they are the result of actual purpose. Now, the genius of Darwin was to basically create an intermediate category 
between things that don't have any purpose at all, where the, the, the telos doesn't, simply doesn't apply, and things that are teleological, where the, the purpose is, is, is explicit. It's actually the result of meaning. And that's where teleonomy comes in. So a teleonomic process, like natural selection, in fact, natural selection, as far as I know, it's the only teleonomic process we know of. Uh, there may be others out there, but that's the only one that I know of. Uh, a teleonomic process gives, as you were putting in a minute ago, the appearance of purpose, right? Uh, and so it allows us to recover the, 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 the um, Aristotle's final question, you know, what is this thing for? But in a way that excludes the teleology. So when a biologist says, a biologist says um, the, the heart is for pumping blood, it doesn't mean that in a teleological sense, it doesn't mean that the heart was created by some intelligent being uh, in the same way in which, you know, the keyboard on my computer is created by an intelligent being for the purpose of me to be able to type stuff. Um, but, it, but, but, but Darwin does mean what, that the heart has a function. It's not there. It's not just an assemblage of things. It's not a stone. It's not a... It has a role relative to a system. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. It has a, a functional role within a system, and, uh, and we cannot make sense of it. Mm. I, um, unless you actually take on board this idea that there is a function and role. Uh, everything else in, in outside of biology doesn't, and social sciences, doesn't have right. a function. It's not like, you know, atoms don't have functions. Right. Planets don't right. have functions. They can, be, they can be viewed that way, but then that is purely the appearance of purpose. We That's could right. view physical phenomena as purposeful, but that really is just the appearance of purpose. Whereas right. with biological phenomena, it's not just an appearance. They it's do brilliant. have a role relative to a system, and that is not eliminable in understanding what they are. Correct. But that role is not the fact, result sorry. of someone making it on purpose to have that role. Right, right, right. right. Precisely. So, so, in fact, at this point, you know, ever since Galileo and, and friends, uh, it really makes no sense to apply the category of purpose to physical objects. You know, nobody, it doesn't add anything to our understanding of it. Uh, it it's not like you could say, oh, well, the purpose of the earth is to rotate around the sun. That, that makes no sense from a modern perspective. You know, this right. is something that maybe 2,000 years ago somebody might have said, but today it makes no sense. Try, however, to get away from the language of purpose uh, in biology and you lost biology. So the point is you cannot have a purely mechanistic biological account. Correct. Okay. Um, Even though, again, I'm not talking about any right. magic going right. on here. There's but no there magic. are a lot of mechanistic accounts in biology, right? It's just not that, it's not that they can sure. all be given, right? It's, um, 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 because, you know, certainly if you think about physiology, right, yeah. um, um, all our physiological accounts are roughly speaking mechanistic, right? So if I want to explain, you know, why did, why did this person's hand go up, right? Um, yeah. I'm going to give it a, an account in terms of a series of antecedent events, physical, physiological events that sure. made the hand go up. Um, um, and so I think here's the question. I mean, whether or not the sort of the, the, the line I'm going to run, run a run is sustainable depends upon this idea of explanation as seeking antecedent events that are sufficient for subsequent events. Um, yeah. Do you think it's still fair, even with all the caveats that we've just introduced, to say that what explanation in the natural science largely consists of are these sorts of um, uh, efforts to explain uh, subsequent events by pointing to antecedent events that are sufficient for them? Or do you think it's not even fair to say that in a general understanding there's qualifications, understanding there's complications, understanding right. that at the fringes of science there's all sorts of weirdness, um, do you think that that's still a roughly fair way to categorize explanation in the, in the natural sciences now, I'm saying? Um, okay, so I would say that it is fair up until the development, the evolution of sort of conscious beings capable of meaningful actions. Okay, I think I'm, I'm going to draw a line there. It, that's it, that's why I would say that after that, what you're really engaged in is social scientific explanation, which I think is of a fundamentally different kind. Well, let's let's have a discussion in a minute about whether that's a fundamentally distinct different kind. Yeah. I don't think it's a fundamentally dis different kind. I think, however, that there is a significant, you know, there is there's, there's a major uh, difference there. I don't think it's any different, um, if you will, 
uh, so the transition between the biological sciences and the, and the social sciences, to me, looks a lot like the transition between uh, physical, physical chemistry on the one hand and biology uh, on the other. So, you know, okay. it, right. So I, the way I see it, obviously, biological systems are physical systems. They're physical chemical systems. They're, they're made of molecules and atoms. And those molecules and atoms follow the laws of physics and chemistry. There is nothing, you know, ma again, magical there. And yet... Some of these systems that are made of atoms and molecules are alive and others are not, uh, right? And now I, we're not going to get into the discussion of what is the definition of life and all that. No, I don't think it's necessary. Right. Yeah. To me, life is like porn. Uh, you get recognized if you see it. And, <laughs> right? and so there are, you, you know, said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and I stand behind it. Uh, so, so I mean, regardless of the, you know, likely intermediate cases, there may be cases where we might not be able to tell exactly, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, you and I are alive and my computer is not. And, and certainly the rock outside of my, on my door is not alive. And yet they're all made of the same stuff. Okay. So it's the way that stuff is organized that makes something alive or not alive. Um, so in the same way in which I see biological systems fundamentally as physical chemical systems and yet they require additional explanations additional la layers of explanations because otherwise you don't get uh, biology you just you just get physical chemistry and you cannot make sense of a lot of biological processes similarly at the other end of the complexity scale i think that human beings of course are biological organisms they are biological objects and therefore they're also physical objects so we are subjected to all the, the laws of physics and chemistry and we are subjected to biological explanations uh, and yet those by themselves are not enough to account for human phenomena you're not going to have a reduction of the social sciences to biology but that doesn't mean in my mind that biology is irrelevant to explanation in the social sciences just like you're not going to have a reduction of biology to physics, physics and chemistry, but that doesn't mean that physics and chemistry are irrelevant to understanding biology. Okay, Does so that make sense? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying, and, and I, I understand the way that you see this as a really uh, a matter of degrees of complexity rather than of category differences. Right. Um, um, and now that you're saying this, I'm getting clear. I, I think I still am going to want to claim that they're a matter of category differences, and so um, maybe will switch around and I'll throw out something about what I take, see, see as a sort of a categorical difference and then you can sort of respond to it. So to sure. me, um, what I'm doing when I give a physiological explanation of a series of motor movements, okay, is a fundamentally different sort of thing as what I do as a sociologist or a psychologist in explaining why people engage in abuse. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is that the intentions that would be invoked as the causes of the abuse and the abuse itself, neither of those are what we would call natural kinds, right? These are, in a sense, what these are, are motor movements under certain descriptions. Yeah. And those descriptions are, in a, in, to a great degree, normative, okay? Um, um, and so the motor movements that might ca be deemed abuse in New York <laughs> might not be deemed abuse in Pakistan. Sure. Okay. And so a motor movement, however, is a motor movement in Pakistan or a motor movement. In other words, a motor movement to describe something that is a motor movement is to describe a topic neutrally, right? Is to yep. give it a sort of topic neutral description. Yep. Um, whereas to describe something as abuse is a highly socially, culturally, and morally inflected description. Sure. And so I don't see how, A, how the explanation of that could be anything like the explanation of what we give for a motor movement. Um, and secondly, um, the, um, what we do do, what we do do, what we do do when we, when we engage in these sort of explanation is as much what I would call interpretive as it is explanatory in the, me in the sense meant by, meant by, uh, in this sense that we've been talking about that we agree is full of exceptions and everything. Right. Um, if I want to explain why the arm moves, I give a physiological, uh, a set of physiological causes, 
And those are going to be true whether it's in New York or it's in uh, uh, Pakistan. Um, mm. But if I'm going to talk about why um, people engage in child abuse, let's say, um, um, as much of what I'm doing is as much explaining, talking about why we count this as child ab as abuse over here. Sure. Um, and notice if we have a disagreement, say, you know, the Pakistani also, also ought to view it as abuse. That's a moral disagreement, not a scientific one. Right. So this is why I think this is the base reason. Now we can get into more detail, but this is why I think the difference in what we're doing in explanations in the physical sciences and what we're doing in the social science is of a categorical difference, not simply a matter of uh, increasing complexity. Right. So a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, um, I had a so th this past semester at City College, I taught a course on epistemology across the curriculum. It was called the Unity of Knowledge. And so I had a number of colleagues from different uh, disciplines, uh, from the humanistic ones to the social science to the natural sciences, coming in and you know giving talks about what they were doing. And one of one of them in particular struck me as interesting. And the talk was about um, um, colonialism, right? And the, my colleague who introduced the, the, the topic of colonialism said, look, I'm, I consider myself a social scientist. I, I consider myself some, somebody who studies, you know, the sociology of certain movements, the history of certain, the history from a sociological perspective of certain, certain uh, uh, occurrences. And, and he, he drew my students' attention to the, to the word social science, right? He said, well, why, why don't we call it a science? Other than because, you know, the, there's, there's a, a cachet <laughs> these days about being associated with the sciences, so you get more money because of that. But he said, you know, there, there is an interesting reason why it's, a, it's called a science, he said. And then there's also an interesting reason why we use the word modifier social. He said, so if I want to understand um, colonialism, I need to understand, I do need to bring in, quote unquote, scientific facts, uh, such as you know, an understanding of, let's say, uh, um, uh, resources available to uh, people and societies, uh, an understanding of, you know, the mechanics of certain things going on, including weaponry and so on and so forth. Um, there is a lot of stuff, there's a lot of quantitative stuff that a, a scientific approach uh, to the study of colonialism can, can give me. But, he said, if that were all, I wouldn't understand colonialism. What, it, what it's missing still is the uh, understanding from a human perspective, from the point of view of a human narrative. Why is it that certain people do certain things under certain circumstances? What goes on in their mind? What are they, and not only in the mind of the colonial, the colonialists, but in the mind of the colonized and so on and so forth. And so he said that in his opinion, uh, what he was doing is social science in the sense that it was, that it was melding these two perspectives. On the one end, he needed the, the the scientific approach to things, the quantification, the you know the reliable data, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, he needed understanding that it's possible only once you you, you bring in human teleology. I would say he didn't use that word, but I would say human human teleolo teleology. So meaning, right? Um, so keep that in mind for a second. Now, now the second thing that came to mind uh, when you were talking. Um, about a particular action, you know, being being uh, acceptable ethically in one society and not acceptable in the other society, even though the action from a physiological perspective is exactly the same. Well, there is a parallel there in biology. I mean, when we say that something uh, that, that certain physiologies or certain structures are adaptive, right? So let's say uh, the ability of a leaf to capture light in a certain way or something like that. It's always understood that that, sent, that phrase is within a particular context. There's nothing that is adaptive no matter what. It's always a dependence of the environment in which we, you live. So a particular leaf structure is adaptive in one environment, but if the plant starts living in a different environment, that thing is actually not going to work. It's not adaptive. And even though the physiology is exactly the same, the molecular biology and molecular structure is exactly the same. You change the context, and all of a sudden, and that that leaf is not going to work, or it's going to work in a very different way. So, if you put those two things together, look, I understand, uh, and in fact, I, I, I'm going to agree with you that certain, you know, you put you put my my original uh, sort of um, 
uh, description of things in, in, in the way of a continuum. But continua are not necessarily monotonic and they're not necessarily sort of graded, right? You can have a continuum that has sort of certain variation and then a very sharp uh, uptick of some, some variable or some whatever it is that describes the system. And so it looks like the two systems now, the system before and after the transition is completely different, it's qualitatively different. Uh, while in fact it is not, there is an underlying sort of quantitative uh, transition. That's the way I see the transition between non-living and living and the transition between non-social and social uh, or non-meaningful and meaningful. Uh, that is, yeah, they look very different. And those differences are quantitatively large enough that if you want to talk about them being qualitative, I'm on board, I'm okay. What I'm not okay with is to say, therefore, there's an entire category of explanation that now all of a sudden becomes irrelevant. I still think it is relevant. It's just insufficient at this point. Okay, this is very interesting. And, and it's, it's, it may be bordering on an, a very academic discussion that may, that may be, you know, this is a risk we'll have to take. There's very smart people in the audience. Um, Why not? Um, I totally, the thing about adaptiveness is a very good point because what it shows is that... Um, that one of the, some of the key concepts in biology can only be ascribed contextually, right? right? And so that strikes me as a reason why you're never going to get laws of biology like you'd get laws of physics, right? Because they're simply not going to admit of the kind of generalization that we typically think of when we think of a physical law, right? right. But it seems to me that the separate the question of whether something is ascribable only contextually is a separate question of whether something is only ascribable under an interpretation. Okay, that oh. strikes me as diff, and that that's where I see the category differences happening. Right, is that in the social sciences, when we give explanations, and I'm putting it in the scare quotes because I'm not sure I think they are explanations, uh, given what we've how we've understood them. Um, both the alleged cause and the alleged effect. Um, uh, are described via terms that can only be ascribed under an interpretation, right? Right. So let me give you an example. So let's keep with the example of abuse, just to keep it simple and not fly all over the place. So okay. um, when I hear when somebody when, when I so, so there's there's been a number of you know this is this is a very hot topic now. This is on everybody's mind. I would say it's a bit obsessive right now. Um, the whole child abuse phenomenon. Okay, um, 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 and um, you have a lot of sort of breathless scientific announcements. We found something in the brain, right? So all the child molesters have right. some sort of brain, uh, there's something about their brain, right? So that is an attempt to give a physiological explanation, right. uh, to give a physiological cause for this behavior. Um, and what I'm, I guess what I think about this is that such a cause is, such an explanation is completely irrelevant. It does not help you understand anything because of course um the brain of the pakistani is no different from the brain of the person in new york okay and the pakistani and I'm, I'm using please don't i don't want to have like a daily of pakistanis like saying we're not a bunch <laughs> of child abusers so let me just invent a fake country okay country x right where yes. in which child brides are common and are integrated into the culture and part of the religion and all this sort of stuff okay Right. For first of all, the phenomenon wouldn't even be a subject of social scientific investigation in that society because it's not viewed as a pathology. It's not right. viewed as socially dysfunctional. It's simply not interpreted in such a way that it would cause, it would raise social scientific interest. That's number one. Number two, it seems to me that if you really, the explanation that would be useful for why in America, if we were asking in the United States, well, why is there all this child, why, why do people engage in child abuse? We're going to refer to various kinds of um, uh, uh, socially and uh, inflected um, descriptions of the person of people's mental states, right? So we're going to say things like, um, "Well, it's a result often of people who have failed to develop uh, correct boundaries, right? It's the result right. of people who have um, who have had, let's say, um, uh, dysfunctional families in various ways, and so on and so forth." But notice, all of those are not themselves topic neutral descriptions of states of yeah. mind they are themselves interpretive um, normative uh, 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 descriptions and so it seems to me that 
those are the those are the kind of explanations that are really useful, right? And what it, not, not not pointing to people's brains. And what that reveals is that what we're really not we're not really trying to give a series of antecedent events that are sufficient to explain a subsequent event. What we're really trying to do is explore why do we interpret these sorts of behaviors as dysfunctional in this way in our society, right? And what are the relevant sort of social, contextual, personal, familial uh, relations that give rise to them, right? In which in which we find them, right? But that strikes me as an entirely different enterprise from explaining why someone's arm goes up. Um, okay, yes and no. So, a couple of points. First of all, uh, notice that uh, even uh, even even you a minute ago used the term sort of causal explanations. Now. The fact that we use the word causal as a modifier of explanation to me suggests that there are some explanations that are non-causal. Fair enough. Yeah, fair right? enough. Um, and in fact, I gave you uh, 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 right at the beginning some examples in physics of explanations that are non-causal. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So why did the, the the particular atom, uh, uh, you know, decay? Uh, well, because the laws of quantum mechanics says that it has, it has to decay, but there was no cause in the sense of a specific antecedent toward that specific event, right? So, so one suggestion that I'm going to put forth is that, yes, you're right, human motivations, human cultural context, human ethics, and so on and so forth, are all part of the explanation of certain behaviors. And in fact, they may even be the most relevant part uh, uh, of that explanation. Uh, but nonetheless, they're not the entire explanation. So let me let me uh, give you an example. Now, that gives me to the to the second uh, point I wanted to bring up. So you said, you know, oh, if the guy is engaging in certain kind of behavior, you know, pedophilia or whatever it is, uh, the brain is the same. Well, yes, and I'm to, to a broad extent that's true. Uh, and and the brain the brain, of course, is the kind of thing that precisely it's the kind of organ that allows us to react differently to different external conditions and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, there are also interesting cases where you literally can say or can arrive pretty close to the, you know, what sounds almost like a joke, you know, my brain made me do it. Well, of course your brain made you do it. Your brain is what, you know, where your causal powers, you know, mental powers reside to begin with in interaction with the external world. Uh, but there was this case that I described, I think I described in Answers for Aristotle, of this, uh, this guy in the southern United States, I think it was in Virginia, um, a few years ago, that all of a sudden started uh, engaging, you know, feeling very strong sort of uh, uh, attraction to, to young boys and engaging in, in pedophilic behavior, essentially. And he got in trouble and, you know, he got, eventually got caught. Uh, I think it was actually, it wasn't engaging in, in directly in any behavior, but it was, you know, looking at child yeah. pornography or something like that, right? And so he got in trouble, got discovered, got in jail, then, and he kept saying, you know, this is not me. This is, you know, I don't understand why I'm doing this thing all of a sudden. This, this was a sudden behavior. They discovered that he actually had, was developing a fairly large tumor in his brain in, in an area that is actually directly related to sort of uh, uh, you know, the higher cognition, the higher level of control of our, of our actions. They removed the, the, the brain tumor, the feeling of, of interest for, uh, for young uh, boys disappeared. And then it came back a few years later, and sure enough, the tumor had been back. Now, this is a fairly striking case, and yeah, I'm not, not even close to going to suggest that there is going to be that kind of very simple, very mechanistic explanations about all of our behaviors. I don't believe that for a second. In fact, what I think it's interesting is precisely that that case is anomalous. It's so clear-cut. It's so, it's, it's so obviously uh, uh, outside of the norm that it teaches us something. Right, because that, it's very unlikely that in a society in which child child marriages are normal, that they've all that all the all the adults are walking correct. around with brain tumors. That's, right, that's right. That's right. right. No, no, no. Absolutely, that's that, not where I was going. Yeah, what I was going over was that here we have a case of, uh, if you will, uh, basically the opposite of what you're you're presenting. You're presenting a situation where you have we all have similar brains. Now, we don't have the same brain, obviously, but we all have very similar brains. And and but then the 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 environmental the the culture environment changes, and those brains make us behave in different ways, right? So in other words, the majority of the of the explanation 
uh, the burden of explanation goes into the society, into the in, in, into the cultural milieu, as opposed to the brain, because the brain is essentially constant. What I suggested is a situation. What I presented is a situation where this is exactly the opposite. The cultural context is fixed. The, right. the guy didn't move. He didn't, right. didn't right. live in a different society. The brain changed, and, and there was so this he, change of behavior. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so that's. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, you, you know, obviously you need both levels of explanation for human behavior in general. I mean, after all, if we didn't have brains, brains we wouldn't behave at all. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We didn't have that kind of. No, brain. this is about a explanatory frameworks. Uh, and it's, it's not about that. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's why I, what I'm saying. So, so when I'm I, as you know, I'm myself very skeptical about the my brain made me do it kind of thing. You know, it's like, oh well, uh, it's the Pleistocene brain that 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 causes us to do certain things. Well, no, uh, you know, the, the Pleistocene brain allow us to do a certain number of things. Right. Because without a brain like this, we you're talking be like a sort of a, like these evil Eve Sykes sort of uh, yeah. these glib sort of. Well, the reason why men sleep around more than women is because of their evolutionary, you know, spread their seed as opposed to yeah that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. there is another example that I think it's relevant, and it's actually Gord. I, I'm going to give you a hand in this case actually because the example uh, I, I thought was very interesting and. Um, but it goes into your direction uh, of, of re in the, your way of reasoning. Uh, and that is this. This is also something that I, I think I mentioned in Answers for Aristotle. So there was a study about uh, the reaction to alcohol uh, in, in, in two different groups uh, that was uh, carried out in Connecticut a number of years ago. And what they did was they, they, uh, uh, they noticed, the researchers noticed, noticed that uh, the Irish um, uh, sort of community in the Irish community, there was a high degree of, you know, sort of drunk behavior and, you know, sort of uh, the kind of the typical thing that we associate with drunk behavior and so on and so forth. But they also noticed that in the same area, same same town, uh, uh, there was an Italian population which apparently consumed about the same amount of alcohol and yet was not engaging in those kinds of behaviors. So the question, what, what the hell is going on there? The alcohol is the same, so the chemistry is the same. The brains are the same because we don't. Nobody believes that Italians and Irish have different, you know, enough genes that their brain structure is completely different. So what the hell is going on there? And there, the explanation really was a question of social science in the session, in, in where the the social is 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 more important than the science. Um, meaning that, well, what was going on was that the, the, the cultural context in which these two things were happening, the Italians were having, consuming a large quantities of alcohol, but that was within a family environment. Around the dinner table. Around the dinner table right, where a certain right. kind of behavior was expected. The Irish in that particular population were consuming the same amount of alcohol, but that was at a pub where the, the purpose was to get wasted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... That it tells you that, yes, in those cases, clearly the, the answer is not biological, it's not chemistry, it's society, it's intention, it's behavior uh, uh, from, a, from, from a point of view of sort of uh, what happens in one group is very different from what happens in the other group. So I think you're right if you want to claim that not only we wouldn't understand human behavior if we didn't take into account sort of the, the intentions and the social uh, milieu and so on and so forth, but in fact, that it doesn't make any sense to look for explanation of, of human behavior outside, you know, without taking into account those levels of explanation. Those levels of explanations are very often the most important ones. Uh, just like in biological systems, you know, the, the, the adaptation and the natural selection is often the more important level of explanation and not the physic physics and chemistry. But the physics and chemistry is what allows natural selection to actually work. It, it's what constrains the system. And I think it, it's useful to see human beings in a similar way. That is, yeah, the explanations tend to be about intentions and societies and cultural and so on and so forth. But of course, all of those are made possible by a particular biology without which none of that would be actually happening. And occasionally that biology does crop, crop up, you know, creeps up in a, in a way that actually directly uh, 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 furnishes a major part of the explanation, as in the case of the, of the pedophiliac, suddenly, you know, on and off pedophiliac with the brain tumor. Right. But those are exceptions. I do think that those are exceptions. I don't think that's the norm. Right. And so, you know, I'm, I'm realizing sort of the complicating factors here. You know, I think that my initial idea was that 
explanations in the in by explanations in the physical sciences we typically mean causes, right? Yeah. Whereas I don't think that what we call explanations in the social sciences typically can be called causes. Um, um, well, the question the question is whether this is a good way of making this distinction, or yeah. whether there's a different way of making the distinction that still captures. Because it's not clear from what all well, that you said that it's really a good way to characterize explanations of the physical sciences as referring to them as causes. Um, um, right. So and, remember. And, Causes are good um, uh, and they're useful uh, in, in in between the quantum world and the social world. Yeah, everything in between is, or causes. even the biological, because the biological yeah. accounts are not purely causal either, because there's a teleonomic dimension to them. Um, yeah, that's true. But the teleonomic dimension, well, that's an interesting point. But I, I still think that even in biology, outside again of of actual teleology, so outside of actual intentional actual intentions. Um, you know, even in biology, uh, I think you can give a mechanistic, I mean, you know, biologists talk about me me uh, yeah. causes, uh, even at the level of, of natural selection. I mean, the causes are more complicated yeah. than the ones that, that act at the physical chemical level, but I still think it's a matter of causes. Now, I noticed that in your, in your essay, you say, well, you know, and of course, I'm not about to give you an account of causality of, of you know, causes here. But I think that at some point we might have to, because when you say, for instance, that, oh, well, uh, in physics and chemistry and perhaps in biology, causes are the explanatory, you know, uh, level, you know, the explanatory concept, but, but reasons, let's say, right? Uh, are the, the ex what, what carries most of the explanation in terms of humans. Well, somebody could say, yeah, but reasons are just a type of cause. Right, and, and that's where I said that that's not the case. Um, um, but, and, but you cannot say that without actually say, well, why not? You know, why, right. why wouldn't you count? Right. So I'm actually generally curious, why wouldn't you count reasons as causes? Well, because, because, partly because of how I understand a cause, roughly, again, with a million complications, as... Uh, an antecedent event that's sufficient for a subsequent event, right? Um, um, okay. And thus, A, you have to have the relation of sufficiency, and B, the things you have to be talking about have to be events, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that that I don't think that the typical uh, categories that we seek to explain in the social sciences are events. Um, I think that they are events under various intentional descriptions. Um, and that that therefore um, that, that that's that that's a very different sort of animal. And it also has so, so, so one reason is that I don't think that in social sciences we really are explaining we're really giving uh, antecedent conditions for various events. Um, secondly, I don't think that the purpose is the same. In other words, the reason we seek the explanation um, the, in the social sciences, and this this is what I said um, in the uh, in my essay, is that. It seems to me that what we're really trying to do in a social scientific explanation is render people's behavior intelligible right. within a kind of narrative, right? That is, we have, and, and that narrative is teleological, right? We have a sort of a picture, sure. um, and we're trying to fit people's behavior into this picture, and it's a picture roughly that that renders them reasonable, renders their behavior reasonable in the sense of being intelligible to us as fitting within this picture. Um, I think that the, that's not the main reason why we seek out explanations in the physical sciences. If anything, the physical sciences more and more are telling us that the universe is not intelligible in this way, is not reasonable in this way, does not fit into a, a, narr a, the sort of narr a teleological narrative. Um, huh. um, and that's the reason why so many people, for, for example, aren't satisfied with the scientific picture and add a religious picture on top of yeah, it, right? Yeah, it's yeah, precisely right. because they aren't getting out of, um, right. um, but I do think that in the social sciences, mostly what we're trying to do is understand, is, is render people's behavior intelligible within a story, right? Yeah. Um, uh, whereas well, that's not what we're trying this. to do in the physical sciences. Well, let me, let me try to parse this for a second. So, um. Because one could one could argue that actually uh, science in general is in the business of providing intelligibility of whatever the subject matter is within a narrative. Uh, now, the sci a scientist probably wouldn't put it that way. But not a teleological narrative. No, not a teleological right. narrative, right. right? For sure. 
but there are different kinds of narratives, right? And and so um, now a scientist probably wouldn't put it this way, but but as a philosopher, I would say, look, uh, scientific theories are not out there. They're 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 human constructions. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's true that physicists often talk about the theory of everything as if it were out there to discover, but th we forget that what's out there to discover is the physical world. Um, when we present a theory, a theory is a human creation. It's it's something that is made so that we can make intelligible the That's behavior right. of certain bodies or certain phenomena, right? So when we when Copernicus came up with his theory about the solar system, the point was to make uh, intelligible the movements of the planets. Right. Which was not intelligible before. It, it was difficult to, to account for. And a theory, a scientific theory, is a type of narrative. Now, you're right. It, of course, it's not a teleological narrative, for sure. Uh, but it is a kind of a narrative. It's created by a human being. Right. Uh, for the purpose of other human beings. You know, nature doesn't need theories. We need theories. So I would say that the general idea in science, and I'm going to push it to say, as in fact, any science, is in fact understanding under a, the const, um, in the form of a narrative. Now, that narrative can take itself, then can take different forms. If we're talking about fundamental physics, it will take the form of mathematical equations. Right. If, it, if we're talking about the special sciences, except for the social ones, it will take the, the form of, of cause and effect. Uh, so theory is based on cause and effect. And if we're talking about social sciences, it will take the form of you know, uh, human intentions. And, and so we have, you know, non-teleological narratives, we have teleonomic narratives, and we have teleological narratives, but they're still narratives in the broader sense of all of this is for the purposes of making sense of what's going on out there for our own, you know, little minds. Right. And, and so in that sense, I rather see the social sciences along these continuum uh, being in the business of, provi of providing us with understanding under certain levels of descriptions uh, and center certain types of description. Right. Again, I would agree with you if you say, but those types of, and levels of descriptions are far removed from physics. Yes, they are. And they're pretty far removed from biology. Yes, they are. Again. Um, I guess, I, you know, and this is, this is the, like I said, a work in progress. So in a sense, I'm working this through as I'm talking to you about this. Sure. Um, I guess what I, the, the, where I see really the sort of the category difference is that it seems to me that maybe what this really at the end of the day is, is a matter of normativity, right? That is that the narrative, the, the narrative that, that, we, that we seek the social scientific explanations to inform is largely a normative narrative, right? Um, um, I'm thinking now of, I'm thinking of, I don't know how familiar you are with Wilfred Sellers, uh, his yeah. distinction between the manifest image and the scientific image. Right. Uh, right. And more and more, I'm starting to think that, that what this issue is, is really, a, is that issue. Right. Um, and uh, I, the reason I was fiddling around is because I was pulling something up that I, that I deliberately quoted uh, before I um, got on with that, that I cut and pasted before I got on with you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Sellers describes the, the manifest, Here's what he said. Here's how he describes what the manifest image that, that is the image that the, what I'm calling the 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 the, the image that the, the thing that the social sciences are interested in talking about, right? Um, as opposed to what the physical sciences are talking about. Um, he says that this talking about it as a narrative quote provides the ambience of principles and standards above all those which make meaningful discourse and rationality itself possible within which we live our own individual lives, right? So in yeah. a sense, we live our lives at one level as part of a story. And that story is a story that is a heavily moral story. It's a story that has a moral arc to it. Um, it's a story that, and, and, and it's a story whose social, political, economic, and all those other social scientific dimensions are heavily inflected by that moral arc, right? Um, think about, I mean, so many of the things that we're interested in understanding in the social sciences are behaviors that have various moral significance, right, for us. We're interested in mob violence. We're interested in uh, uh, why governments uh, uh, deprive people of liberty. We're interested in... Um, um, 
predatory lending practices. We're interested in so many of the things we're interested in in these social sciences are things that go directly to um, the ways in which human motor movements are meaningful, right? right. Um, um, and have significance, have, have a kind of moral, social, political significance. And I just don't see the business of understanding all that as in any way like the business of understanding why people's arms and legs move, right? Well, why their, yeah, why their yeah. pupils dilate. And I see that as a category right. difference, not just as a difference in complexity, um, because we're talking about an entirely different kind of thing, and we're engaging in the inquiry for a very different kind of purpose, right? Uh, I'm going to certainly grant you it's not the same kind of inquiry as, as you know, why do pupils dilate? Uh, Although, well, forget the pupils. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to grant you the pupils. I only use that because of my example yeah. in the essay of voyeurism, right? So yeah, a yeah. social scientific account of why people are voyeurs right. is not the same kind of account as the account of why people's, people's pupils dilate, even though voyeurism yeah. involves all sorts of pupils dilating, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, 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 right? No, that, that's correct. Now, however, although it's true that the majority argument or certainly a large chunk of what we're interested in in terms of social sciences does have what you call a normative di uh, uh, dimension. You know, it has to do with ethics in this construed and broad, in yes. broad sense. Yes. Not, certainly not all human behavior has a normative direct uh, dimension, right? No. I mean, right. So, so if I am thirsty, you know, if, if, I, if you had to explain why I'm going to get up in a, in, in a minute, I'm not. But <laughs> I'm going to get up in a and minute. Drink a and, glass of water. Uh, sure yeah. But that's not what the social scientists are actually. most... But that's not what the social sciences are mostly interested in explaining. No, right? but, but, but then again, true, that they're not interested. But it is a type of human behavior which does have intentions at, um, as part of the explanation, right? So, uh, you know, it, it, and, and in fact, it's a perfect example for me because mm, it is the kind okay. of behavior, it's a simple behavior, of course, you know, granted, it's nothing as complicated as a mob, uh, uh, you know, uh, behaving in a certain way. But, but um but it is the kind of behavior that shows that, well, yeah, there is a biological component there. That's I'm thirsty, uh, and I can give you a completely physiological explanation of why I'm thirsty, right? But the fact that I'm getting up at this particular moment and going to the refrigerator and open and getting a beer instead of, you know, uh, water or getting this particular beer instead of another beer or whatever it is, or beer instead of wine, that has not much to do with being thirsty. It has to do with a lot of, you know, so social motivations and, you know, public advertisements and uh, customs and so on and so forth. Right. Um, right. So similarly, you know, if I have sex, well, that's because I have I lust for a particular, you know, uh, person. OK, but why am I lasting for in general? Well, I last in general because I'm a particular type of biological being that has certain particular types of urges. But the way those urges actually manifest themselves, you know, this person rather than that person, this moment rather than that moment, um, is, is greatly influenced by, you know, motivations and intentions and, and, and cultural background and so on and so forth. So those are behaviors that don't have necessarily intrinsically a, uh, uh, you know, an ethical dimension to it, a, a normative dimension, and yet they still involve intentions and they still involve you know, a social aspect to things. And those are easier, I think, to understand than the ones that are normative. Because you're, the, the ones that are normative, you're right. There's, there's an added layer of complication there. But I think that, that what is, what may, uh, you know, the, 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 the danger may be of jumping straight to the normative behaviors and thinking that it's the normative aspect that is fundamental, while in fact the normative aspect is just one more complication but it's not what's fundamental to the to, to the understanding of the behavior. I'm not trying to to knock down the ethics, as you know. I'm very interested in in your know, normative yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But um, but but those other examples, I think, in my mind at least, make it clear that that there is no necessarily a, a this this uh, irrelevance of biological explanation on the one hand. And it is also the case that, that social explanations not need necessarily to be normative. Right. right. And I don't know, I, I guess I don't know that I want to say that the biological explanations or physiological explanations are always everywhere irrelevant. More what I was trying to say was that it's a very different kind of thing to give a physiological explanation of a series of motor movements 
than yeah. it is to give a social scientific explanation um, of an action, yeah. which is Agreed. a bodily movement under, under an intentional description. Um, yeah. um, Agreed, but, yeah. but I don't think um, that's correct. But, but that distinction, I don't think, is different in kind from the distinction that I was making earlier between biological and physical systems, right? right? right. So it's true that biological organisms, again, are made of molecules, and so they're subject to the laws of chemistry, but the laws of chemistry by themselves don't tell me enough. In fact, they tell me rather little about why a plant has a, a, a leaf shaped in a particular way. It's molecules, but the, the reason why there is mole those molecules are organized in a particular way is because there's a function, and that function is the result of natural selection, and natural selection is definitely a different kind of explanation from physical chemical explanations. Right, right. In um, fact, it, cannot be, it literally cannot be reduced to physical chemical explanation. You, do, you don't have a theory, and I don't think you're ever going to have a theory. Well, of, there couldn't be one if, if what right. you're saying is correct, right? I mean, right. Right. Um, I don't think it can be one. Um, all right, so let me just, you know, we're, we're probably at past the point at which I'm well prepared enough to, to sort of discuss this in a way that's not just going to be rambly and 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 yeah. and back and going around in circles because it, it, it's too difficult. Um, the subject matter is too difficult. I just want to one last thing um, that you didn't yet comment on with respect to what I had said is, and let's just focus strict narrowly on whether we can treat social scientific explanations as causal. Okay. Okay. Um, and 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 let's bracket everything else um, because that's certainly one of my one of my. I sort of the core ideas is that I don't know. I don't think that uh, that that social scientific explanations and really what we're talking about are what we would call folk psychological explanations because that's yeah. ultimately what they all involve, right? Yes. Um, um, are genuinely causal. Um, you, would you agree that a cause, a genuinely causal explanation, both the um, the the, the antecedent and the consequent, both the cause and the effect, have to be event, have to be discrete events. Ah, gosh. Um, that's certainly a classical interpretation, but, you know, discrete events? I don't know. We, we live in the world of quantum mechanics where there are no, no discrete but events. But there there's no, we, there there's no causality either, right? You said yeah, you but there's no teleology either. Right. So, so if, the, if the goal is to exclude uh, you know, to sort of set aside the teleology, you don't get the teleology just by doing away with causality. That's a, one way to look at it. The other one is, uh, I don't know. I mean, there is a lot of biologists to argue for uh, simultaneous causality, for, for, for okay. uh, you know, for causality, uh, for even downward causality, uh, things like that. So th that's the problem, that by causality, people mean all sorts of different yeah. stuff. Right? Um, do you think, let, let me put, how about putting it this way? Do you think that... Um, do you think that I, what I want to get at is whether you, you, you would describe certain things as events, right? And so yeah. um, clearly arms and legs moving are events, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, is a riot an event? What I guess I want to say is that a riot is not an event, although it, because – a riot isn't simply arms and legs moving. It's arms and legs moving under all sorts of intentional descriptions that yeah, are a... Because, I'm sorry? Care, be careful because now you're getting close to begging the question, right? I mean, you, you, you're, you're, you're embedding in your definition of event a intentionality. And, well, if, the, if you do that, then, yes, of course, we have to agree by definition. The question is, can, an, can something intentional be an event? I would say that a riot is an event, or a series of events, if you if you will. Right. I guess what I'm getting at here's what I'm getting at, and maybe it's just too too esoteric. But what I'm getting at is, I guess, once you say that something is an interpretation, right? So when I say that a, a, a riot, to describe something as a riot is to take a series of motor movements and under a certain interpretation. Yes. Well, interpretations involve the following of, of rules. Interpretation is essentially a form of rule following, and rule right. following is a is, is inherently a, is public. And so, in other in other words, um, I guess what I'm saying is, the motor movements are discrete discrete events, but the riot is the discrete events as understood within a community of speakers. 
Sure, sure, sure. But sure. that whole thing is not an event, right? Um, okay, let's say that. Sure. Uh, and so that's why I want to say when the social scientist explains that bigger thing, he's yeah. not strictly speaking explaining an event. Right. He's as much explaining how we interpret certain events, how a community interprets certain events, as he's explaining events. To explain events would be to explain the motor movements. Right. Uh, okay. I so, guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah, okay. I, I, can, I can follow you there, and I still, I think I can still recover my, okay, please. my point of view. And that, and that is, again, by making the analogy with uh, teleonomy instead of teleology, right? Okay. So teleonomy being the, the appearance of purpose in biology. I think that's actually very useful uh, as a as a sort of constant contrast uh, category, because if we go straight from physical, purely physical events to social events, I think we're missing the bridge, as I was saying earlier. Okay. So let me let me try to so let me rephrase what you said, you know, to, to see if I understand it correctly. What you're saying is, look, um, if you were a Martian and you had no concept of m mob riots, uh, you would observe a certain number of events, because those are events, and you would describe them as, oh, there is a number of biological organisms there, you know, moving their legs <laughs> and their hair and, you know, and, 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 and emitting sounds right. and things like that. And that would be it. You wouldn't add, and that's a riot. In order to say, and that's a riot, you need to understand something about you, not only human customs and the culture and all that, but also human intentions, that, that these people, these are not just random movements. Those people actually have the intention of doing whatever it is that they want to try to do. Great, okay, Grant you, granting you that. Now, let me go back to my example of the plant that, that uh, deploys the leaves, you know, so there are some plants, for instance, that, that um, move their leaves during the day following the sun, right, in order to maximize photosynthesis. Well, if I were a Martian not accustomed to the concept of natural selection and, and, and biological, and, and, you know, and, and physical biological environments on earth, I would say, I would have a description there that would say, ah, uh, there is this, this living organism that has these structures, these structures are made of such and such stuff, organized in this way, and those things move, period. But if I'm a biological, a, a biologist on earth, I add a, a level of description and says, yeah, and it does that because it wants, right, mm -hmm. uh, as a, as a, as a, conscious intentions, of course, but as a result of a teleonomy that is both built in by natural selection, because it wants to maximize capturing the light. So it seems to me that the situation is analogous with, with describing a movement of people as a mob. That is, now I'm adding an interpretation there. I'm adding a layer that it's not, it doesn't come out of the simple physics of the object. I can have a complete description, physical description of the object, which, however, doesn't make any sense to me because I don't know why the damn thing is moving uh, following the sun, just like in the way the Martian would have a complete description of what's going on in the mob without realizing what the hell is going on because he doesn't know that it's a mob. It doesn't have the concept of a mob, right? So you are, again, I think absolutely right that without that intentional explanation, you don't get an explanation. You don't, you know, you don't, you, you just don't get it. You, you say, okay, there's this stuff going on and I don't know what the hell is going on. But I don't think that that is, what I disagree, I guess, is I don't think that's different from a biologist who has, has to add the layer, the interpretive layer, the teleonomic interpretive layer. Otherwise, uh, living objects are um, incomprehensible from the point of view of simple physics and chemistry. What you're saying basically is that one step further, just in the, in the same way in which biological organisms are incomprehensible if you stop at the descriptions uh, provided by the, the conceptual tools of physics and chemistry, you can say look, human beings and human societies are incomprehensible if you stop with, uh, at the level of description and with using the tools that are provided by biology. Agreed. That's, that's right. But what you're doing is you add another layer of explanation. Now, whether you want to call that cause or not, I'm frankly not hung up too much on, you on don't that. Th you don't think it's actually really that important. Um, no. The reason why, you know, here's the reason why, um, and maybe this is just because of my, my influences, but the reason why I tend to think it's important is because there has been a big fight um, in, over the last century, A, as to whether folk psychology is a science, B, yeah. whether folk psychological explanations really are explanations in the manner of science. And depending on the various answers, you've gotten what to me are all sorts of perverse 
lines of investigation yeah. um, um, on both sides of it, whether it's eliminative materialists or people like Fodor who want to say, oh, yeah, um, giving intentional explanations of intentionally described motor movements is just like giving a causal explanation uh, uh, in, in physiology, right? And I just yeah. find that to be uh, – and so that's why I care about yeah. no, whether I, we call these things causes and yeah. how we understand the, the relations and – no, I agree, and and I think that I'm. I guess I'm going to be in this in disagreement with both Fodor and uh, and the eliminative, eliminativists. Uh, um, uh, although probably closer to Fodor than the eliminativists, so I mean that the eliminativist position is untenable. This this this, this is you know right. this, uh, just to be clear for our listeners, what we're talking about is the, you know this idea that for instance I can reduce the concept of pain to oh the the C fibers in my leg have I fire. completely eliminate the the, the okay. folk level of description the intentional yeah. level of description altogether yeah that I think is really not tenable right I was going to say something stronger than that but I'm going to hold <laughs> be nice tongue. be nice <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hold my tongue I, I don't think it's tenable I mean yeah. obviously the C fiber firing is part of what's going on there. Uh, but it isn't the whole thing. And in fact, we know, I was just reading an article very recently about the connection between pain and attention. And we know that we can distract people from pain. Their C fibers keep keep firing and they just don't notice. Okay, That's right. Because their mind, their attention is focused on something else, somewhere else. And that's because apparently the human mind has a limited attention, uh, capacity for attention, as everybody who has played video games knows. Right. So... Um, so I'm certainly not an eliminativist. I think that's a no starter. Uh, you cannot eliminate uh, what you call what people do call folk psychological yeah. explanations. Right. Um, on the father side, where I disagree with father is, uh, you know, where, where he goes into these this whole business that it's not a science unless it's based on laws. You know, he famously wrote this thing, yes. uh, this infamous, I think, book. Uh, with all due respect, because I really think father is one. You're talking about his book on evolution. Yeah, exactly. I think that that book was better than it was bad in the sense that even the ways that it was bad, it raised what are indeed the crucial issues, right? And I mean, in a relatively clear way, because he's a very good writer. Fair um, enough. Um, uh, um, I will. Uh, maybe we can. We can. Yeah. Uh, another I, one on I, that. <laughs> yeah, we can link my review of that book. Actually, that was Darwin's. What Darwin yeah. got wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically, what I think Fodor gets wrong is that he thinks that whenever there is intentionality in a system. Uh, and whenever there is historicity in a system also, uh, uh, you cannot have laws. And I agree with that. That's, we, you, that's what you were saying earlier, right? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. The reason we have laws in physics and not in biology is because, you know, an atom is an atom is an atom, whatever, right. whatever it doesn't matter where it has been over the last right. million years. But something is only adaptive in a specific context. Right, right, right. And it's a right. result of an, a line of ancestry and so on and so forth. And so you, you have to understand it historically. That's why biology doesn't have laws. It has some empirical generalizations, yeah. but it doesn't have laws. Yeah. It's an historical science. And of course, a fortiori, the social sciences, not only they are historical, right. because social context changes through history, cultures change through history, but there's the intentionality that comes in, right? So I agree with Fodor as far as that goes, that is, that the social sciences and even the biological sciences do not admit, you know, they're not uh, no, uh, nomological, they're not, they don't admit of laws. But then he goes, he jumps off and says, therefore, they're basically not sciences. They're, right. they're just, it's, you know, one thing after, after, after another, and there's no rhyme or reason. It's, no, there is rhyme or reason. It's just not the kind of rhyme or reason that you find in physics yeah. or chemistry. They're perfectly viable sciences, uh, but they require other stuff. They're not reducible to physics. It sounds to me like you're almost saying he's making the same mistake that you're saying that you think I'm making, and that is that... Um, and it's partly due to having too narrow and too classical a notion of what an explanation consists of. It sounds to me, um, I'm yeah. part of what you're saying. Um, yeah. um, right. And whether this winds up merely being a verbal difference of whether we call things explanations or whether there's something deeper behind it, I think um, maybe the viewers will have to decide after watching all of this. I'm still not sure, entirely sure myself. Um, yeah, fair point. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah. That, um, you cannot untangle that until we have a discussion on causality and on explanation. Yeah, yeah. And for one, on one thing we agree, one is not the same as the other. Yeah, we, I think we agree on much more than we disagree. I mean, one thing that's very important that we agree on is that we agree that the physical explanations alone do not provide us 
with the understanding that we want when we typically engage in social yeah. scientific expo- uh, uh, social scientific investigation. We yeah. definitely agree with that. I would I yeah. would say that that's a no brainer, except that it isn't, as yeah. you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that I otherwise. So, but yeah, I I think we definitely agree on that part. Yeah. All right, Massimo. Well, I I really greatly appreciate you. Um, putting up with my meandering um, um, and working <laughs> through good. these things. Um, my only consolation is I know the issue interests you too. And so it's not just an indulgence on your part. Um, and um, I look forward to more of these fantastic conversations with you in the future. Absolutely. I think the next one might have to be from Rome since, as you know, I'm on sabbatical and I'm, I'm living That's for right. Rome. Do you want to say just for one second what, is, what your project is? You're on sabbatical and what, yeah, is your pro- what is your sabbatical project and what are you doing? Give us two minutes on that. The, my sabbatical, which just started uh, a week ago or so, and it's going to go on until the end of the summer, uh, during, during which I will spend four months in Rome. And uh, the project is to write this book, which is tentatively entitled How to Be a Stoic. And, you know, our listeners know about stoicism because, you know. You've talked about Zeus, it a little. By Zeus, we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> More than once. Uh, and so the idea uh, as it is unfolding now is that um, this is a book for a general public and it's supposed to be, you know, make, uh, get across the idea that stoicism is a very practical philosophy. And so the way I conceive the book is that it's going to be an indirect conversation, not a, not a dialogue, but an indirect conversation between myself and Epictetus. And I'm going to have Epictetus basically imagine that Epictetus is my companion who is explaining to me what stoicism is and i uh and i challenge him and i ask him questions and i and i get answers from him about the same the, the basic idea came from rereading parts of the comet a dante's comedy uh where he goes through hell purgatory and paradise with the with the aid of uh, virgil first and and then of course of Beatrice. Uh, now it won't be a dialogue because i don't you're write, not gonna you're not gonna write it in a dialogue form no, nor, nor am I writing a poem. <laughs> because I was going to say, if you wrote it in a dialogue form, we could do a video and I could play Epictetus if you wanted. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There will be some direct quotes from Epictetus yeah. uh, uh, to which I will, on which I will elaborate and I will respond. But now, writing a dialogue, it's, as you know, it's very difficult. Very hard, yeah. It's and very, is the trip for the purpose primarily of stoking your imagination or are you actually using archives that they have? Are there archives you want to get into over there? Yeah. It's mostly to sort of get away from New York as much as I love it, uh, to sort of orient myself, be able to orient myself and focus on, on the project on the one end. But also it is inspiration. I, I rent an apartment in Rome not far from the Forum and the Coliseum where Epictetus was for a, a good part of his life. And I'm actually going to take a couple of um, side trips, uh, again, sort of inspirational, if you will, side trips. One to uh, Hierapolis, which is in Western Turkey, where Epictetus was born, uh, and another one to Nicopolis in Northwestern Greece, which is where he died and where he actually established his uh, school after he was, uh, you know, uh, sent into exile from Rome uh, from, by the Emperor of Vespasian. So uh, it's going to be an interesting sort of voyage of discovery, and then we'll see. The, the book is due at the end of August to my publisher, and I, I've actually just been told uh, a couple of days ago, that the the basic books will try to get it out by April of 2017. Excellent, sounds fantastic, and I look forward to doing a dialogue with you uh, from uh, from Rome. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Massimo, take care of yourself. You too. All right, bye bye. <laughs>